Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today for day two of Freedom Week. Uh, to get things started off tonight, I'd like to welcome the president of Northwood University, uh, Dr. Keith Pretty. Well, good evening. Good evening. We, can, we can reply better than that. It's late, but it's a beautiful day. Um, welcome to day two of Freedom Week here at Northwood University for 2015. We're pleased that all of you are here tonight uh, to be a part of this. Uh, Professor Takaroff has worked very hard, of, among other people, um, to develop this concept. And this is, in fact, the second year that we've had Freedom Week at Northwood University. How many of you in this room tonight were a part or participated in any of the lectures last year for Freedom Week? Any of you? I see a number of you around the room. Great. Great. How many of you have participated in the Freedom Seminar, which kind of brackets the uh, uh, Freedom Week and comes at the end of our academic year? I believe it will be in April this year, which is actually a, a credit-granting class um, uh, that runs for four days that uh, Professor Machek and Professor Nash run. Have any of you participated in the Freedom Seminar? Maybe not at this point in your careers, but you might want to look at that at the end of this academic year coming up later in the year. Well, Freedom Week is very important at a place like Northwood University, as we believe very strongly in freedom in every possible way. Freedom is the first value we express in our code of ethics. And it's, it's something that we believe deeply in for all individuals but particularly for our students. I'll let there be light. Um, we, we also want our students to feel free to study, to, to look at things from a very different point of view, from a very conservative or a classic liberal point of view um, that you don't find at every school around this country. And so I'm pleased that you are taking the time this evening to hear from some extraordinary speakers. I know some of you were here last night, heard from Dr. Stehauer and other speakers. Uh, later in the week, you're going to be treated to, to hear from one of your own alumni of this institution, Dr. Dan Smith, uh, who uh, worked with us early on um, as he was a student here uh, in developing the traditions of freedom at Northwood University, went on and received his PhD from George Mason University in Northern Virginia and today is a faculty member uh, at Troy University uh, down in Alabama and um, is someone that has made a real difference in the world of, of liberty and freedom. But we believe that you also as students can make that difference and we're here to encourage you to do so. And One of the ways you can do that besides participating in this event, participating in classes and other seminars like the Freedom Seminar, but we annually publish a publication called In Defense of Capitalism. In fact, this summer we came out with the sixth edition of In Defense of Capitalism. Uh, this is a publication of all of the various articles and blog posts that our faculty, our staff, and our students published last year during the last academic year, concluding on June 30th. And so if you're inclined, and I know some of the students did presentations last night, and there are more during the course of this week um, to be involved in this. If you're inclined, I would encourage you to see Dr. Tim Nash. Dr. Nash will be, I believe, one of your closing speakers. In fact, maybe the closer on the last day and, um, of, of this particular event on Friday. Uh, and Dr. Nash is the individual, he's the senior editor of In Defense of Capitalism. And if you have something that you have prepared or will be preparing over the course of the year or will be working with a faculty member to prepare, we would love to have you be published, give you a record, give you something to point to, to potential employers um, of your good work and your beliefs in freedom. So I'm not going to take a lot of time tonight. You've got a lot of great speakers coming behind me. Um, but I want to thank you for participating in this event. I particularly want to thank Dr. Takaroff, who's 
kind of hiding in the back back there for putting this together. It takes a lot of work. Um, he does much of this work during the summer months when he's in his home country and far away, but uh, imposing and pushing and conjoling a lot of his professional colleagues all over the world to share their thoughts with you on freedom so that you, too, um, can develop your own beliefs and are free to do so in an institution like Northwood University. Welcome. Have a great evening. All right, uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Michael Duffy. I'm a senior this year at Northwood University studying automotive marketing and management. I'm also currently the general chair of the upcoming Northwood University International Auto Show, so I'm looking forward to uh, being back here in two weeks to be talking about that. That's a great example of capitalism that we have here at this school. Uh, first off tonight, though, I'm going to share something briefly, some thoughts on Genesis 1 before we move on to uh, our first speaker. The original source of all that is good is the very act of God who created both the earth and man, and who gave the earth to man so that he might have dominion over it by his work and enjoy its fruits. This is the source of our natural rights. God gave the earth to the whole human race for the sustenance of all its members without excluding or favoring anyone. This is the foundation of the universal destination of the earth's goods. Freedom is universal and it is for all. The beauty of capitalism is that it supports that truth. Uh, I'd like to welcome now Ann Bradley of the Institute of Faith, Work, and Economics, and she'll be speaking to us tonight on the morality of capitalism. So give her a warm welcome, please. Good evening, everyone. It's such a great opportunity for me to be here with you. Uh, I'm so thrilled to be part of this exciting event. I know you're going to hear from a lot of great speakers tonight. Uh, I just want to introduce myself briefly. Um, as the president has said, my name is Ann Bradley. I'm an economist, and I work at an organization called the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics. So I'm very interested in things like the morality of capitalism and how we think uh, about getting to a better world, a world with greater flourishing. And that's really what I'm going to talk to tonight. Uh, the title of this talk is, How Do We Think About the Morality of Capitalism? What does that mean? mean. Um, and so what I really want to do is start with asking a question um, about our ends. And that's really what economists do. They say kind of what are the ends that we're after and then what are the best, most productive means to those ends. Uh, as Christians we have to do that. We, ha we know that we live in a world of scarce resources and that those resources have a lot of different things they can be used for. So we must be really good stewards and diligent in these questions. Uh, I think the power of economics also is that it helps us pull back some of the ideology that might mire us down and really try to get to the truth. Uh, so what are we after? I would say that we're after a world uh, with lots of opportunities for everyone. Uh, and in that world, we can get closer to a sense of flourishing. Um, I don't think that we're, we'll ever have um, perfect flourishing on Earth, um, and we know that there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of constraints. There's a lot of imperfections in all of us. Um, there's things that wear us down, both that are our, are our fault and that are not our fault. And so we can't get perfect flourishing, but we need a picture of how to get towards flourishing, and we need to set that as our goal. And so I think that um, when we talk about flourishing, we talk about a society where people have autonomy over their lives, where they are not the victims of oppression or corruption, where they can wake up in the morning and say, you know, I'm going to start a food truck, or I'm going to be a teacher, or I want to stay home and raise my children, or I want to be the CEO of a company that I hope to grow into a large company. And that all of those things can happen peacefully. Uh, without plunder, without theft, without corruption, without uh, cronyism, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So this idea of flourishing is a big idea. Uh, I think it encompasses a lot of things. Um, theologians use the word shalom, uh, and I think that we tend to interpret that in the, in the modern world as peace, uh, which we could say is the absence of conflict. But shalom and real flourishing is so much more than that. So I really want to make that our focus tonight. What does it mean to flourish? Uh, again, I think it means a society where people can wake up, they are um, in charge of making uh, decisions about the trajectory and the path of their lives, and that when they do that, uh, 
they uphold some moral values that we all subscribe to. So in other words, that you know, they wake up and they find new ways to serve one another. And in the process of serving one another, they create value, they create wealth, and they can become richer, not just personally, but they can add to this corporate sense um, of wealth creation and prosperity. So that's what we're after. And to get that, we have to have freedom. Uh, we need a lot of different types of freedom. I'm going to talk about some of them. Um, but, you know, at a macro level, we need economic freedom, we need political freedom, and we need religious freedom. And that's kind of the macro perspective of this, but I want to, before I get there, I want to talk a bit, a bit more about how individuals wake up in their daily lives and think about this. And so when we think about the morality of a system that we tend to call capitalist, I have to say from the get-go here that capitalism is not my favorite word. Um, it's it's a it's a phrase that was coined by Marx. Um, it which doesn't necessarily make it bad, but I think it has a lot of baggage around it. I think uh, it can mean cronyism. It can mean um, uh, or it has the synonym of greed associated with it, and kind of stealing from other people to get what you want, um, stepping on people's back to kind of climb the income ladder. It just has a lot of baggage. Um, I'm not sure that the average American, when they hear that, they get a warm and fuzzy feeling. And when we just talked about flourishing, I hope that we had a warm and fuzzy feeling because that's what flourishing is. Whole life, well-being, and prosperity um, is what we're after. Uh, and so capitalism, I don't think, does a great job of getting us to think mentally about what we're after. But nonetheless... Uh, it is something that we talk about in economics, so it's worth discussing here in the sense that it has to do with who owns what in a society and what type of economic system uh, we want to put in place. So that is a really important place that economists start with. What are individuals in the society encouraged to do? Kind of what's our anthropology? How are we made and created? What are we after as humans? Because really, we can't ever talk about these big macro systems, like whether capitalism is good or whether socialism is good, or anything else for that matter, until we really understand individuals, who they are, um, and what we can change about individual behavior and what we can't change. And that's the insight of economics that's extremely helpful. And so I, I really want to talk about um, our anthropology. Uh, who we are as humans, what it means to be human, and, and how that plays out um, amongst anonymous strangers, which frankly is most, most of the people that we deal with day in and day out, the people who we rely on, we don't know. And that's a really key component of uh, this system that we call capitalism, which I kind of want to rename um, free market voluntary exchange, or voluntary exchange based on um, the freedom of markets to... Um, allow prices to emerge, which really kind of fosters this exchange among people. So before we get there, let's talk about anthropology a little bit more. What are kind of the key characteristics of us that are part of our humanness, are part of who we are, and really uh, indelible? We can't change them. Uh, and there's a couple of things that I want to talk about. And I think Ludwig von Mises, um, who wrote Human Action, has really one of the best descriptions of what economics is. It makes it frankly, very accessible to all of us. It's the science or the study of human action under conditions of scarcity. And that's really powerful because it means that um, what humans do is they choose. And the reason they choose is because they want to always improve their current conditions, their current level of happiness. We're always working to maximize our happiness levels given the massive scarcity and constraints we face every day. And so humans are purposeful. Um, we're not kind of bumbling around um, waiting for someone to tell us what to do. We actually are very good at knowing what um, we want most of the time. And um, we try our best to get that for the least amount of cost to us. Um, so we're self-interested people with purpose. Uh, Self-interest I want to talk about a little bit because it's also part of our anthropology. It's very much key to what kind of economic system is appropriate to bring us together to serve one another rather than an economic system that fosters plunder, theft, corruption, all these terrible things that we've seen throughout human history and that we want to avoid. Um, and so 
you know, self-interest is something that I also think has a really bad rap. Um, we don't want to think of ourselves as self-interested, perhaps, um, because I, it seems that there's a fine line between self-interest and when we talk about selfishness and greed. And I want to make the distinction that self-interest is quite different than greed. Self-interest is why you are in school. Um, and being in school is hard. There's probably... Um, more fun things that you could maybe be doing than going to class and doing your homework and paying tuition and all you go into the library for countless hours. These things are hard and we do them because we want to better our conditions, right? We want to always improve. And so self-interest involves personal sacrifice. It means that maybe um, we go do the hard things to get to the things that we think are going to improve our conditions in the long run. So. The key takeaway here is that self-interest can and often does involve personal sacrifice. Greed never does. Uh, greed is literally, you know, stomping on someone's back to get what you want. Bernie Madoff, what he did was greed, and it was bad. It hurt people in the process because he had to steal from others to get what he wanted. We want a system where a bunch of self-interested people who are largely strangers um, who are kind of bumping into each other uh, in society, we want a system that fosters those strangers, based on their own self-interest, to serve each other, not to plunder. So we want to get rid of the Bernie Madoffs as much as possible, and we want to foster strangers thinking about how to serve the people, their fellow man that they're really never going to meet. It's quite phenomenal when you think about that. And it doesn't run on altruism. And that's a key takeaway as well for a market-based economy. If we have to have good people in political offices, people that don't make mistakes, people that have perfect foresight, uh, we're never going to get there because we are fallen, imperfect, sinful people. Um, and it's the same for a corporation. It's not about getting the right person meaning the good person, to be the CEO. Um, it's not about trying to, you know, find the person who has no greed and put them in charge of the large companies like Walmart and um, Apple. It's actually trying to find the right institutions that surround those people that encourage them to behave uh, in a manner that fosters wealth creation, again, fosters value creation. Uh, and so these are the key takeaways in, in kind of the moral discussion about capitalism because free market capitalism or free market voluntary exchange has a, a very good track record of, of doing just that, of fostering the service of anonymous strangers, of not being Bernie Madoff, um, of actually doing quite the opposite, of engaging in sacrificial behavior, um, reinvesting your money in the company to think of new innovations and find better ways of doing things. And when we find better ways of doing things, what we're doing is economizing on our scarce resources. And this is the key economic question because we have unlimited wants and very limited means to satisfy those wants. And so uh, what an economic system that's moral is going to be about is, is finding the best way of doing things so as many people as possible can participate in flourishing meaning as many people as possible have increased access to goods and services that are better in quality and always getting better in quality and always getting lower in price. Those things help us understand material well-being. And really the historical episode of the past 200 years have shown that when we get the institutions right, when we get the economics right, we can actually do this in ways that are unprecedented, and that's really exciting. Um, and the other thing I would say about our human anthropology is that um, we're cost-benefit um, analyzers. We're rational, as economists would say. We're not perfectly rational. We make mistakes. Uh, we don't have good intentions all the time. But generally what people try to do is maximize their benefit at the lowest possible cost to them. This is actually what I would call good stewardship. Um, because if you can spend 10 hours studying for an exam, uh, and get an A, uh, then, you know, why would you study 15 hours uh, to get an A? If you can find better, more productive ways of economizing your time and studying more productively and effectively, then you're going to get a, the same benefit or maybe even a better grade by studying less hours. You want to find a way to do that. And really, um, that's what economics helps us understand. That's the insight that's key. We always want to encourage people to try to maximize their benefit at the minimum cost to themselves, but 
while serving others, not while stealing from them. And so free market exchange, when it, it plays on our anthropology, um, we can do these things. But we can't deny who humans are, and that's why I like to spend time talking about our anthropology, because if we pretend that humans are robots uh, that need to be told what to do, if we pretend that humans aren't self-interested, um, that they actually do everything based on altruism, then we're probably going to institute uh, policies and regulations that aren't going to get us where we want to go because we have the wrong assumptions about human nature. Uh, and we have, if we understand that the humanness of who we are can't ever be removed from us, then we have to start with, okay, who are we talking about when we're talking about humans? What are they capable of and what are they not capable of? And if we can get there, then we can understand what kind of system best encourages those self-interested, often incorrect, Adam Smith said, more often stupid than not. Um, you know, we more often don't know uh, the way to do things than we do know the way to do things. And so we need a lot of help. Uh, we need each other. I would say the last piece of our anthropology is that we're finite and limited. Um, we can't do everything we need to do uh, to thrive. Uh, in fact, we can barely survive when we're left to our own devices. Um, and that's a really key understanding. I think economics, rightly understood, brings and injects a sense of humility into who we are and what we can do um, that's important for us to remember. So just a little thought experiment. Uh, when you woke up this morning and you got ready for your day, I want you to think about all the things that you did um, before you even walked out the door of your house. You probably did many, many things that you largely did not even think about. Um, I'll just give you a rundown, of the oversimplified rundown of my morning. I use my cell smartphone as my alarm. I wake up. I have two young children. I get them up. We get dressed. Um, we shower. We brush our teeth. Uh, we try to get cleaned up and looking good. And then we go downstairs and we eat a little breakfast. I make a little coffee. And then we get in our car and go on our way and proceed with our day. And these things that we do in the morning are to prep us for the real work that we're after. Um, the things you did in the morning are probably similar. Or maybe you didn't get children ready. Maybe you did, but you got yourself ready. But that wasn't the key focus of your day. That was actually to prepare you to do the work um, that you were after that day, whether it's studying or going to a class or going to work. Um, but think about how important those things are and think about how little you had to do with each of them. I didn't make my smartphone. I have no idea how to make my smartphone. In fact, um, you know, when my smartphone breaks, I don't know what to do. I have to find experts who can help me. I have to run to the Apple store. Um, I don't know how to make a toothbrush or a tooth or toothpaste for that matter. Um, and if left to my own devices, I would have poor dental health and be a little stinky uh, is my guess, as would all of us. I don't know how to grow coffee beans. Uh, I don't know how to make the ceramic mug or the travel mug uh, that I pour my coffee in. I don't have a cow that I milk to get the milk for my children's cereal. So I'm relying on hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people that I will never meet. And what's shocking about all of this is that I just blithely put these things in my mouth and ingest them. I put the toothbrush in my mouth. I didn't inspect the toothbrush factory. I have no idea who the workers are. I don't know what their values are. Um, yet I get these things that make my life better. And I get to be ignorant about their production and their coming into being, their fruition. That is key. That's the morality of capitalism. That's the morality of a free market system. That when left to our own devices, we barely survive. And we often perish. Economist Brad DeLong uh, has done some studying of consumption uh, um, over the past two million years. And as you know, uh, two million years ago, we didn't have a lot of data. <laughs> we didn't have a census. But what he's trying to understand is a GDP per capita um, over time. And if you look at it, it's pretty much a flat line up until recently. And I'm going to share that graph with you in a minute. And what he says that's, I think, really startling is 75% of what we consume today, the goods and the services that we consume today, 75% didn't even exist before 1800. Um, 1800 in real terms was not that long ago. 
this is the morality of a free market system, that we have all these things at our disposal, like laptops, like a projector, like microphones, like indoor plumbing, and we don't have to know how to make them. We don't have to bring them into being ourselves for them to exist. That's the morality of capitalism because it doesn't just benefit a certain class of people. It doesn't just benefit the rich. It, in fact, benefits all of us. I bet as a student, you don't right now consider yourself extremely rich. But in real terms, you are one of the richest people on the planet. I want to share a graph with you right now that I think is really astounding in terms of thinking about how far we've come. And again, we have to think about why we got there. So this is a graph of, of GDP per capita over the whole world um, from AD 1 to about 2001. And if you look at it, it's, it looks like a hockey stick. That's what economists call this, the hockey stick graph. Really, human consumption has been near zero for most of human history. It has only been until recently that it has skyrocketed our ability to consume things, and not just the rich, but all of us. That, again, is the morality. Um, I think the immorality of getting economic systems wrong is something I want to show you here, this picture. This is a picture of a woman in the developing world trying to, to acquire water. And I just want to give you a little glimpse into what her day might look like. I've done a, a, some research on this, as a matter of fact. In the developing world, women and children are primarily responsible for water acquisition and filtering. Um, and when you live in a remote village, what you have to do is find a container and you have to walk to a water source, and it could be four miles away. Um, and in walking to the water source, it's hot and your children are in tow. And you get to the water source and the water is dirty because cattle um, and all sorts of other animals are sharing this water source with you. So life is very difficult. In fact, this takes many, many calories. Uh, and when you're living on $1.25 a day or perhaps $2 a day, you don't have that you can't afford the calories. Uh, and the problem is that um, this has to be replicated multiple times a week. And then you have to get the water back, and you have to find a very imperfect way to purify the water. Uh, what I want you to think about is that this woman in this picture, and all women and men who have to do this every day just to get water, something that we take for granted, um, these people uh, were made in the image of God just as you and I are. Uh, they have creativity, they have unique talents and skills that they could be unleashing on the planet. And they're unable to unleash them on the planet. Why? Uh, because they live under a set of institutions, a lack of economic freedom, a lack of political freedom, and a lack of religious freedom that don't allow them um, to become wealthy, that don't allow them to foster their creativity. That's immoral. That's unjust. And so when we think about systems of capitalism, systems where people are allowed to individually own property and try to innovate and be entrepreneurial, uh, we get the opposite of this. We get, you know, my, my and your experience every day with water collection, which is pull a bottle of water out of the fridge or uh, turn on the tap and, and you get bottled water. And so I can't underestimate how important this is for us as we think about the morality of a capitalist system. Because without that, um, human capital and the creativity of millions and millions of people is on the line. And so we have to get this right. We can't get this wrong. Um, there's so much at stake. And so the morality of a capitalist system is that it allows people to live in to who God created them to be, to pursue excellence, to experience the dignity of their humanness, and to contribute to flourishing, not just for their own consumption purposes. The benefit of capitalism is when we do our job well, when we work hard, we're freeing other people from having to figure out how to make toothbrushes and having to purify water. I don't have to think about those things because I get to go buy them at the grocery store cheaply. We need to liberate the rest of the planet that is not the benefits of capital, the beneficiaries of capitalism as you and I are, so that they can do the same. Thank you so much for letting me be here with you tonight. Uh, at 
this time, people are collecting uh, the note cards that you guys picked up when you walked in uh, for questions. Does anybody have any that they have not uh, written down yet that they need time for? Or something? OK, uh, I have one question uh, for you. Uh, despite the historical evidence, uh, why is it so challenging to convince people today, particularly young people, that a capitalistic system is more moral? This is like ESPN. Dale, should I, uh, you want me to go again with that? Sure, okay. Um, all right, despite historical evidence, uh, why is it so challenging to convince people today, particularly young people, that a capitalistic system is more moral? You want me to go again? Oh, okay. What's up? And can you hear me? You guys want to answer? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think so. I'm not. I don't know. We're not supposed to answer. We're asking. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not just like making conversation. Pardon? Okay. Hi there, Ann. Can you hear me? I'll be right here. Can you all hear me? Oh, yes. Definitely can hear you. Okay. I have a question for you, actually, if you can hear me. If you can hear me, I'm sorry. I can't hear you. Okay. I will, I'll act it out. How do you guys act out historical evidence with hand motions? <laughs> Where's the camera? Should I walk it over there? Or can he type it? Go again. All right, I'll try it again. Okay, uh, we'll try this, and uh, despite historical evidence, why is it so challenging to convince people today, particularly young people, that a capitalistic system is more moral? That's a great question. Up next, we have Michael Clark. He's an economics professor at Hillsdale College, and his topic will be entrepreneurship.
welcome to my talk, Tomorrowland, an economist's caution about constructing our future. I'm Michael Clark from Hillsdale College. And what I want to talk to you about today is actually Walt Disney's theme parks. Well, I don't really want to talk to you about the theme parks, but I want to talk to you about the theme parks in order to talk to you about innovation, entrepreneurship, and how wealth and prosperity is generated. And my favorite example comes from Disney. In 1955, the Disney Company built Disneyland. And one of Walt's favorite lands in Disneyland was this land called Tomorrowland. It showcased the world of the not-so-distant future. Thirteen years later, in 1968, Disney had to rebuild Tomorrowland. They completely redid the area, and they called it New Tomorrowland. Why did they have to do this? Why, 13 years after the park had opened, did they have to completely remodel one of Walt's favorite areas? The reason that they had to do this is because Tomorrowland had started to look like Yesterland. And Yesterland was outdated. It was cheesy. It was this vision of the future that just didn't make sense. We didn't think that looked futuristic anymore. A couple of rides or showcase areas were featured in the original Tomorrowland, like Monsanto's Home of the Future, made from plastic. The Monsanto Corporation had this entire like dome-like structure that was completely made from plastic and featured all kinds of windows and glass and all these cool little gadgets, like sinks that raised and lowered to fix children's pipes or to also work with adults. And they had all these neat little gadgets that maybe would be a part of the future. The hover bumper cars were originally done. They showcased more of the flaws of hover technology than they actually showcased the potential benefits of hover cars. Space tourism and these rockets that were going to take us normal individuals into outer space seemed not really like a realistic thing. Even the, the plastic house, the Monsanto plastic house, it was so impractical, no one was currently living in one. People realized this wasn't going to be the home of the future. So they decided to tear it down. And when they decided to tear it down, they were going to take it out in one night with a wrecking ball. And the wrecking ball came in, and it swooped through and hit the house, and it bounced back. It was so impractical, they couldn't even destroy it. They had to go in and basically take it apart piece by piece and tear the thing apart all the way through. The world of the future that they saw in 1955 simply wasn't the world of the future anymore in 1968. It looked old, it looked cheesy, and it looked impractical. As they rebuilt Disneyland in California's Tomorrowland, as they rebuilt, or as they started to build Disney World's version of Tomorrowland, and then they went on and did Paris Tomorrowland and Hong Kong Tomorrowland, they learned from this original lesson. They learned to change Tomorrowland into a retro version of the future. They could not keep up with the changing notion of what the future might hold, of what progress might lead us towards. And so what they did is they said, we're still going to have a land of the future, but we're going to have a land of the retro future. In Paris, they drew from Jules Verne's ideas of the future, and they made a retro Tomorrowland. In the Walt Disney World in Orlando area, they drew from Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon notions of what the future might look like. They had to build a retro Tomorrowland. Why? Because the future, in reality, is an unfolding story full of twists and turns that we simply cannot foresee. I think that most of us, including myself still to this day, even though I focus on this topic, have at some level a biased misunderstanding about the future and the development towards prosperity of an economy. And this is the bias that I would like to emphasize today. We think the of the future as a linear progression from here to there, a technological problem of just figuring out how to build the future. We know what lies ahead. We just have to solve the engineering problem to get us there. 
we have to solve kind of the minute details of what that future is actually there. We need our scientists with our beakers, our engineer with their measuring tapes, just to figure out the details, but we're going to get there. We know phones of the future will hold more memory and be able to operate at higher speeds. We just have to advance this technology. We know driverless cars will help us on the roads eventually. We just have to advance the technology. We know 3D printers will be able to revolutionize living at home. We just have to advance the technology. We think of the future wonders of the world as needing engineering solutions, or perhaps just economizing solutions where we figure out how what we already know how to create we create it, but we somehow find a way to create it more cheaply. When we think of the future as just the next step in front of us, we forget about the creativity that it takes to get us there. We forget about the benefits of individuals using their talents and abilities to try to be a part of that next step. And instead, we become somewhat conceited that we could plan or at least aid the plan that gets us into that proper direction, that constructs a future that we know is going to exist. As a result, we get subsidies for energy solutions that end up wasting energy. We get city development strategies that suffocate the vitality of cities. We get much, much more. If you think back, you can think of different examples where we knew something was going to be a, a, the, the tool of the future, like a segue. We knew it was going to revolutionize the way people got around and people were going to stop walking and become kind of lazy and slothful as they just tilted their way forward or backwards instead of walking from place to place. It turned out that didn't really happen and they're more of a novelty. But it seemed futuristic and we knew it was going to be a part of that future. Because the benefits of freedom of the future are unknown, we cannot really concretely discuss them. So if you listen to my talk and we think about, okay, how do we construct our future? We need to have caution about that. We say, hmm, we might be biased into thinking it's easier than it actually is to construct our future. Well, how do we know what our future is going to be? How do we plan for that future? How do we allow for it to take place? The reality is we can't. The future is unknown by its very definition. And because it's unknown, it's challenging for economists and those who value that search into the unknown to actually talk about. To give one more example of this type of process of discovering or unfolding that the market process actually does, right, I am going to talk about this idea of the evolution of music to get us thinking about how progress actually happens. It does not happen in this straightforward, linear path where we know what is next. It's not an engineering solution. It's this creative, unfolding, open-ended future that is really so important to how we actually progress into the future. So let's think about the evolution of music. In the 1920s and 1930s, we can think back and we have these visions of people being entertained by big bands. Right? That's how we kind of got our music entertainment. We had to go somewhere and actually listen to the band play. Fast forward a couple of decades, and we get the vinyl uh, record. Right? So early 50s, we start listening to records, right? and we can actually take that home with us. If we have a record player, we can take that thing that holds music, and we can put it on a record player, and we can listen there. Right? So we can come through and we can say, here's what we have. We have a record player. Here's the record that holds our music. So before, music was held in people. Now it's held in a record. And then, as you guys probably are aware, uh, a decade or two later, we get the 8-track. And then about 10 years after that, we get the cassette tape. And then about 10 years after that, we get the CD. And this is around the late 80s, early 90s, where this starts to become really popularized. And we hold music on these CDs, right? And then if you think about progress from this point forward, think about this. What holds music next? We all knew in the early 90s, some of you guys probably weren't alive then, 
But we all knew what was next. What was next was going to be the mini CD. It was going to be a CD because lasers were all the rage, right? But it was going to be a small CD. It's going to be, you know, quite small CD. And in fact, you can actually see this in the movie Men in Black, right? With Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith, they talk about, oh, this is going to replace CDs. And it's this little CD, little laser disc. And Tommy Lee Jones says, hey, I'm going to have to buy the White Album again pretty soon because this is going to replace it just like CDs replace tapes and tapes replace 8-tracks and 8-tracks tracks replace vinyl. But what was actually next? Was it the mini CD? No. What actually held our music next was nothing. It was nothing. It was this little digital file out in the ether in the cloud called an MP3. You didn't hold your music on anything. It was a digital file. You could play that digital file on various devices, an iPod or your computer, right? We had all different ways of downloading and uploading and sharing MP3 files. But the thing that actually held our music was a digital file. It was nothing. There was nothing physical that held our, our music. Now, if you go back to the early 90s and you say, okay, let's think about this progress here. We went from big band to vinyl to 8-track uh, to cassette tape to a CD. If you're trying to, just, to explain to somebody what progress or what innovation was going to be next, try convincing them that the thing that was going to be next after the CD would be nothing. You wouldn't hold your music on anything. That's really kind of a complicated thing to do to convince somebody of that. They would probably laugh you to scorn if you tried to convince them of that. Right? The evolution of these products, it makes sense when we look back on everything that has happened. We can tell a story of how, oh yeah, that all makes sense. Because hindsight is 2020. We have a hindsight bias about it that makes us think everything that happened before, it all made sense. But the reality is that the future isn't that obvious. Right? I remember when the uh, when the uh, Macintosh company was going through and they were you know, inventing the iPod and all of these things. And at first we got the iPod. Right? And it was kind of clunky and it didn't have a lot of memory. And then it got smaller and it had more memory. Right? So we got like the iPod Nano and all of these things. Right? So we shrunk it down because obviously smaller is better. And then we revolutionized things and we took the next step. And what we did is we took the iPod and we made it a phone. And we had the iPhone. Right? And then the iPhone, we're like, hey, this is really great. We had all the benefits of having all of our music with us and these files that you know, exist out there on this thing, and now we're going to turn it into a phone, so now it can connect to different things. And the thing that came next, the next line of evolution for that, was actually really weird. I mean, think about this. What we did with the iPhone, right, from the iPod, we were making it smaller because that's more convenient, to the iPhone. The next thing that we did is we said, okay, we're going to like quadruple the size of this thing which it seemed like we were trying to shrink everything down. That was the future. Everything would be smaller, not clunky, right? We don't want to, sh we're going we're gonna to quadruple the size of the thing, maybe even more than that, right? We're going to totally increase the size, and we're going to take away the phone, future, the phone feature. That's the future developmental product that we have. And they called it an iPad, right? A lot of people thought, no way is this going to work. There was no chance that it would work. Saturday Night Live did a skit where they made fun of the name and kind of thought, oh, this is silly. I remember driving in my car and hearing about its announcement and thinking, that is never going to work, right? But now looking back, it's obvious it wasn't a bigger phone that didn't have the phone feature. It was actually a smaller computer with a touch screen, right? So it was actually a great idea. Now tablets are very commonplace. But this all makes sense. Again, when we look backwards, it's very linear. It makes sense. We can kind of tell a story about it. But that story isn't so simplistic when we look at it moving forward. Right? Moving forward, we don't see this line of, oh, yeah, that's obvious. Right? What we need to do to truly progress is understand that we cannot know all of our ends or the means by which we will achieve those ends. 
We'll need millions of people out there experimenting and testing out different paths and different products and different ideas and different ways of achieving different ideas. And some will fail. In fact, most will. Peter Drucker has this idea uh, or, or this, this data point that he says, eight out of 10 entrepreneurs fail within their business within the first 18 months. Eight out of 10 within 18 months fail. The market system is a profit and loss system. The loss is important. It tells us what not to do. It tells us, oh, worthy attempt, not a good idea. But while most will fail, some will succeed and push us forward. And from those advances, we will all benefit. When thinking about the future, remember our bias. Remember tomorrow land. It's not easy to know the future. We don't know the future, and the fact that we don't know our future, and we're not constructing it and building towards it in a linear fashion, where we're building what we already can envision, allows us to be greater than our imagination. It allows our progress to exceed even our thoughts and dreams. We have tendencies to believe that the progression of prosperity is an engineering problem that there's a map or a straightforward trajectory that points from here to there. But the reality is we do not have a map, nor do we know our trajectory. To put a final period on this point, think about the words of Arthur C. Clarke, famous author of 2001, A Space Odyssey. As he suggests a potential vision of the future when he is writing in 1964, he says, Trying to predict the future is a discouraging and hazardous occupation. If by some miracle a prophet could predict the future exactly as it was going to take place, his predictions would seem, sound so absurd that everybody would laugh him to scorn. The only thing we can be sure about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. So if what I say now seems to you to be very reasonable, then I have failed completely. Only if what I tell you appears absolutely unbelievable have we any chance of visualizing the future as it really will happen. If you want to follow up with this idea and read more about this topic, I have a few brief suggested readings for you. First, read F.A. Hayek and the Case for Re Freedom. All right, this is an article you can find just by Googling. Really read all, any of Hayek. Right? Hayek is the best on this topic, the best economist on this topic. But one short reading that you could go through and do, easy to find, you Google it, is just Hayek, The Case for Freedom. Another article is by a modern economist, uh, Dan Klein, who has a, a kind of more concrete uh, example of how this fits within mainstream economics today. He calls it Discovery Factors of Economic Freedom. And then if you want to read more about my example about uh, the Evolution of Music. You can read a short article that I did for uh, Fee called The Economist Who Said Maybe. And then also you can hopefully eventually read a book that I'm working on, although I'm only about a third of the way done with it. Uh, but look for it because we all know with certainty that this book will eventually get done. And we all know with certainty that it will change the world. Thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? 
Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. <laughs> can you hear me at all? I'm going to bring him up. Next speaker is economics professor Ivan Pangracic from Hillsdale College. Hello, students of Northwood University. It's my pleasure to be able to address you for this uh, event for Freedom Week um, and thanks very much to all of your organizers and for the invitation. Um, we're very fortunate to have something like that uh, going on. I I've never heard of anything like this actually being done anywhere else. So um, uh, thank all of your professors and everybody involved. Um, it's a very good thing. So I'm here to talk to you about uh, innovation and innovation is 
maybe not something you have given a whole lot of thought to, but uh, it's really one of the major benefits of the market system. So some of you may have had some basic economics. You may have been studying uh, in microeconomics, uh, for example, something like the perfect competition model. And what you've probably been taught is that one of the nice things about the competitive marketplace is that um, it brings about an efficient outcome. That's a very big deal for most economists, that it reaches efficiency. And that's very nice. No problem with that. However, if the marketplace only offered efficiency, it would really not be um, something that we could recommend wholeheartedly. It goes far beyond that. And in order to explain that, I'm going to be relying on the work of um, two economists in particular, both from Austria, both working uh, primarily in the first half of the 20th century. And the first one is uh, Joseph Schumpeter, Schumpeter, S-C-H-U-M-P-E-T-E-R. Um, and uh, and who's, uh, by the way, usually considered to be one of the founders, one of the fathers of modern entrepreneurship theory. And the other economist being Ludwig von Mises. And Mises is uh, often thought to be the greatest exponent of the Austrian school of economics. Um, and I'm not ashamed to admit that I love Mises two pieces. I know it's terrible. Um, I do hold a Mises chair at Hillsdale College, and I do hold him in a very high regard. And I'm going to give you kind of a combination of both uh, Schumpeter and Mises, what they had to say about entrepreneurship theory. Some of their work was um, uh, quite compatible, some of it not so compatible, but we're going to skip over the incompatible parts. Uh, Schumpeter, by the way, was a very interesting character. And Schumpeter was obviously an extremely intelligent person uh, and somebody that uh, from very early age everybody knew that he was going to go very far. And he knew it himself. Um, Schumpeter uh, did not lack in arrogance, did not lack in self-confidence. There is, in fact, a story about Schumpeter that he would used to say later on in his life as he got older that um, he had three goals when he was a young man. One was to be the greatest economist in Vienna. The other was to be the greatest horseman in Vienna. And the third was to be the greatest lover in Vienna. And it was his great regret in life that he only managed to accomplish two of those three. And then he would add, with a smirk, that he never did have enough time to ride his horse. So that gives you a little insight into Schumpeter the man. Uh, Self-confidence was not uh, any, anything he had uh, trouble with. But uh, for good reason, Schumpeter did, in fact, introduce modern economics to the study of entrepreneurship. And to him, Entrepreneurship was all about introduction of innovation. Innovation was at the heart of the capitalist system, in fact, of the entire market system. And to him, innovation consisted of introduction of something new, something different than it's been done before. Um, new product, new process, new method of production, a new market or a source of supply, a new form of business organization. That's what innovation consisted of. Innovation always was a matter of putting new ideas into practice by entrepreneurs. Incidentally, Schumpeter differentiated between invention and innovation. Invention is what scientists did, what researchers did. Um, he thought that was important, but he thought that in innovation was much more important. And the difference was that innovation was the commercial application of invention. So taking that new scientific insight, um, some sort of new knowledge, and in fact, doing something commercial with it, meaning bringing it to the people in a form of a new product, new process of production, new method of production, that's what was important. That's what needed to be done in order for the people to benefit from this new knowledge. So innovation 
is what entrepreneurs did. Invention is what scientists or guys tinkering in their basements did. Um, that may be important, but if it stays in the basement, if it stays in the research lab, it's of no use to anybody. It's the entrepreneurs that, in fact, bring it to the people and allow us to do to have access to something better, something um, uh, that we had never had access to before. So, the Schumpeter, the the, the the origin of innovation was imagination. Imagination was at the very core of how entrepreneurs were able to come up with innovation. They were able to look at the world, and whereas all of us would just see more of the same, entrepreneurs are able to see something different. You can think of somebody like Stephen Jobs, Steve Jobs, who of course is the founder of Apple and who is the uh, innovator behind things like the iPhone and the iPad. Uh, he certainly had a vision of the world that nobody else shared. He looked at the world and said, I see a world where all of us are going to be holding these little devices that, is going to be, that are going to allow us to connect to the world in an unprecedented way. And we can take those things with us. They'll always be with us. They're accessible to us 24 hours a day. He saw a world which was dramatically different than the one that he was operating in. That was a matter of imagination. That was a matter of seeing that there was technology out there to allow him to introduce a product which nobody had previously thought was possible. Um, now, notice that um, that wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to have a vision of something different. Gates and every other entrepreneur, what they have to make sure of is that this is something, in fact, that people want, that will be demanded by the public. Otherwise, they're going to be introducing products that nobody wants, and that is not going to be making anybody's life, life better. Um, that is not what entrepreneurship is about. Entrepreneurship is ultimately about introducing products that are desired by the public, by desired by the consumers. How do entrepreneurs know whether a particular product is desired by the uh, by by consumers or not? Um, Mises explained that it's very simple. Entrepreneurs have to respond to the profit and loss system. The profit and loss system is the key ingredient in conveying that information to the entrepreneurs. Is something, in fact, desired by consumers or is it not? And what Mises explained is the following, that there is... Um, that what entrepreneurs have to do, they have to look at the prices. They have to look at the prices of the resources that will go into the production of, of the product that they ultimately want to, uh, wish to introduce, that they wish to supply to the, uh, to the co consumers. They, they add up the prices of all of the ingredients, all of the resources that, that go into the production of a particular product, and then they have to weigh that versus the price that they can get for that product and the revenues that they are going to get from that product. Um, if the revenues exceed the total prices, the costs of all of these, of all of the resources that go into the production of, of this product, um, then they will make a profit. What consumers are communicating to them in the process is that we value this product more than any alternative product that could have been made with these scarce resources. We understand that these resources have alternative uses. Other things could be made with these resources. But we do not want any of those other resources. Uh, rather, sorry, products that can be made with those resources. What we want, what we prefer, is this particular product. The iPhone. All sorts of things could be made with the resources that go into the, uh, into the production of the iPhone. Um, not just, I'm not just talking about uh, the material resources. I'm talking about 
the engineering resources that go into the production of the iPhone, into the design of the iPhone. I'm talking about the transportation resources that go into the supply of the iPhone. All of those things have alternative uses. Other things that could they, they, uh, they could be used to supply. When consumers are willing to pay a price which is higher than all of those prices of the resources together, they reward the entrepreneur with um, a profit. That profit communicates to the entrepreneur that in fact he or she is doing the right thing from the consumer's perspective. They are acting in a way that consumers find valuable. If, on the other hand, the price at which they can sell that product is lower than the total cost of supplying that product, the consumers are telling the entrepreneurs, bad, bad, stop. We, in fact, find alternative products that, keep, that could be made with these resources more valuable than the product that you are supplying to us, and we want you to stop. Notice that in the process here, what also happens is that resources are taken from those entrepreneurs that have misread what consumers want, that have not correctly anticipated consumer demands. Those entrepreneurs are going to be making losses. Those losses are going to lead to less command over scarce resources. Instead, what consumers will be doing by giving voluntarily more money to the entrepreneurs such as such as um, uh, Stephen Jobs Steve Jobs uh, what they will do is give more resources to the successful entrepreneurs entrepreneurs that are in fact doing the right thing from the consumers perspective in this process resources are moved from entrepreneurs that are not doing as good of a job of anticipating consumer demand moved into the hands of those entrepreneurs that are doing a good job of anticipating consumer demands. Notice that the whole process is one of what Mises calls consumer sovereignty, that the consumer is king. The consumer is the one that ultimately decides what is going to be done. Producers, of course, decide the minute details. They're the ones that decide uh, which products are going to be supplied, how they're going to supply, be supplied, how they're going to be produced. But the consumers ultimately say, we approve or we do not approve. If consumers do not approve, the entrepreneur has a serious problem. They're going to run out of resources very quickly and probably lose their business. And this is actually something that Schumpeter referred to as the process of creative destruction. To Schumpeter, all of capitalism was a matter of creative destruction. He, in fact, referred to it um, as, um, as he put it, he said, capitalism is a dynamic evolutionary system uh, which under normal and desirable circumstances consists of a perennial gale of creative destruction. A perennial gale of creative destruction. A gale is like a hurricane, right? It's a, it's, it's a storm that's constantly pounding um, people back and forth. To him, that's what capitalism was. There's this continuous dynamic process of figuring out what consumers want. And businesses are being bashed around, being tossed around like uh, little boats um, in the middle of a very wild ocean. Um, the consumers are ultimately the ones that are causing the waves, right? That are, in fact, stirring up the waves and causing all of these boats to be um, bashed around. Why? Because consumers are fickle. Consumers are constantly changing our minds, what we want, how we want it. And the only way that businesses can find out what consumers want is to, in fact, Follow the profit. Follow the money. Figure out how do I make money because that is a key to making sure the consumers are happy. If you are not making money, you are not making consumers happy. Now, 
part of creative destruction, of course, is the destruction part. Creative part is all the is the good stuff, right? That's the fact that we get the iPhone uh, from Steve Jobs. I think I may have said. Um, um, yeah, okay, no, never mind. Uh, so uh, Steve Jobs gives us the iPhone. We love the iPhone. That's the creative part of creative destruction. But there is a destructive part of creative destruction. The fact that there are some companies that will now be beaten, that will now do as well as the result of this new product being introduced. Whoever is supplying the old product, whoever is supplying the product which consumers now are going to say, you know, I'm just not that interested in it, in a flip phone. Do I want a flip phone anymore? How many people want the flip phone? Not very many. Uh, it doesn't really allow you very easy access to the Internet. That's just not what people want in a phone anymore. It doesn't have the uh, computing power. It doesn't have all of the apps that we've gotten so used to. Those companies are going to go out of business um, unless they restructure and figure out a new way of satisfying their customers. Now, notice that as those companies go out of business, some people are going to lose jobs. That's an unfortunate fact. But it's an absolutely necessary fact in order to have a growing, dynamic economy, one that, in fact, is constantly striving to make consumers better. If we had companies that were still producing the, the, the horse-drawn carriage and buggy whips and all of these kinds of things, if they were never allowed to go out of business, we would be producing things that nobody wants. They would be incredibly wasteful. We needed to free up those labor resources in order to get them shifted to production of automobiles. We needed to have a uh, decline in the employment of those people producing flip phones in order for them to now start working for Apple and Samsung and these companies that are producing the phones that we actually want. Um, there is this market turbulence that takes place in the process, right? It's not fun. If you are one of the people that loses his or her job, um, you are now going to be terribly fond of the whole mar market process. But it's the only way we can make sure that consumers ultimately are getting what they want and that there is a constant process in play that is trying to bring better products to them. That's what markets do. That's the dynamic nature of markets. And innovation is absolutely central to that entire process. So I think I will stop here. I think my 20 minutes or so are up. Um, I will uh, take any questions you may have um, after this video ends. So thank you very much. to the to the aisle way. Ivan, can you hear us? I don't think it's turned on. The meeting has ended.
Last but not least, we will have uh, economics professor Peter Klein from Baylor University. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Peter Klein. I'm a professor at Baylor University in Texas and also a research fellow with the Mises Institute in Alabama. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be with you today to talk about entrepreneurship. Um, I know that many of you are economics majors or economics students, uh, but others uh, come from other parts of, of, of campus and uh, some of your business majors as well. Um, there may even be a few of you who have taken a course in entrepreneurship but at most universities, uh, very few students have any formal exposure to entrepreneurship theory or, uh, or, or the practice of entrepreneurship. You might think that's a little bit odd because, um, you know, in everyday discourse, we talk about entrepreneurs uh, as, as important people in society, as people who uh, help to make an economy grow. But uh, we say very little about them uh, formally. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit more about what entrepreneurship is, and more importantly, why entrepreneurship matters. Um, I apologize for not being able to join you in person. Uh, this lecture is bring, be, being recorded in advance, but I'm very happy to, uh, to communicate with you afterwards. Uh, if you want to send me an email or um, uh, give me a phone call, I'd be happy to answer any questions about entrepreneurship or about this talk. Uh, you can see my uh, Twitter uh, information on the title slide, and feel free to uh, uh, contact me uh, that way, or you can just Google search my name, and you can find other ways uh, to talk to me as well. So uh, I think entrepreneurship is important. You probably think entrepreneurship is important, uh, but your professors maybe don't, or at least uh, your professors probably haven't said much about entrepreneurs or entrepreneurship even if you're taking economics courses. Entrepreneurs are the agents who drive the market economy, yet most economics courses, most economics textbooks, many business courses and textbooks really don't know what to do with the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur doesn't fit neatly into the standard sort of models and theories, and so often people tend kind of to ignore them. But if you just ask you know, if, you, if I asked you, if you asked uh, your friends, if we asked people walking up and down the street, uh, what is an entrepreneur, they would probably think of uh, famous individuals like uh, Steve Jobs or Richard Branson or maybe Dr. Dre. Right? These are people who have not only built great companies, but have brought us exciting new products and services things that make our lives better, you know, things that we can hardly imagine uh, doing without. But, uh, you know, who are these folks? Uh, can we understand what they do in a more systematic way? Can we bring economic theories to bear on entrepreneurs? Uh, what I want to convey to you in this very brief discussion is that, yes, we can. That in fact, in some branches of economics, some approaches to economics, in particular that are associated with the so-called Austrian school, we can think about the entrepreneur in a more systematic way. Now, the way that most sort of folks on the street think about the entrepreneur, and even the way that some textbooks think about the entrepreneur as as uh, a, a business person, in particular, a small business person. 
now certainly Steve Jobs and Richard Branson and Dr. Dre are not running small enterprises, but we think of them during their startup phase. Right? We think of Steve Jobs not just as the CEO uh, of Apple, one of the world's largest companies, but as a teenager uh, in you know, his dad's basement uh, in California, tinkering uh, with electronic components and coming up with, uh, with, with, the, the, um, you know, with the first Apple computer. And uh, as you may know, there's yet another Steve Jobs biopic in the works. There's a big Hollywood movie with uh, Michael Fassbender, who seems to be starring in every movie uh, this year, uh, playing the lead role. Uh, you might think of Dr. Dre as a young musician, and I guess he's uh, in the Straight Outta Compton movie too, right? Uh, you know, we think of these guys when they started up their companies, and maybe we even think that once they're running a big company, they're not really entrepreneurs anymore, they're executives, they're managers, maybe even bureaucrats. Um, what I want to suggest to you is that you know, while small business and startup companies are extremely important in an economy, entrepreneurship is much more than small business and startups. The way most people, uh, the, way, the way we often think of entrepreneurs in everyday language, the way entrepreneurship is typically discussed in the literature, is as what, what I would call an outcome or a phenomenon, meaning that entrepreneurship is something you can see and smell and touch. For example, uh, self-employment. People who work for themselves are entrepreneurs. Uh, people who work for others our employees. That's a very common way we think of entrepreneurship. In fact, in some uh, you know, surveys, uh, uh, census forms that you might get in the mail, uh, you might be asked to list your occupation, doctor, taxi driver, uh, professor, entrepreneur, home, homemaker, janitor, whatever. Well, entrepreneur is just another occupation, meaning someone who runs their own company. Uh, we often think of entrepreneurship as small businesses, startup companies, new businesses, like the ones I was mentioning before, or maybe the development and marketing of new products. When entrepreneurship is the act of giving us the iPhone 6S, which is supposed to be introduced, I think, tomorrow or the next day or, or this week, or maybe by the time you watch, the, watch this, it will have just been introduced. Uh, the, the important thing about uh, these aspects of entrepreneurship, while clearly important, is that they're somewhat limiting, right? So clearly small businesses, startup companies are entrepreneurial, uh, but entrepreneurship may be more than something we can see and touch and observe. Now, the reason that most uh, researchers are particularly interested in these outcome or phenomenon approaches to entrepreneurship is, A, they want to be able to teach it, Right? And we can teach things about, we can teach self-employment law, we can teach some principles of small business management, we can write books like Starting a Business for Dummies, and uh, we can collect data on the number of small companies, the ratio of, of self-employed to employed people, the number of new products introduced on the market, and we can do sophisticated quantitative analyses of these phenomena. However, if one were to read the classic economics literature on the entrepreneur from people like Ludwig von Mises or Joseph Schumpeter or other uh, or important business historians, uh, you, you would realize that they have in mind actually something much broader and more general than just a particular type of firm or a particular type of business. So let me suggest to you an alternative way of thinking about entrepreneurship. And the entrepreneurship as a way of thinking or a way of acting, that way of thinking or acting might be creativity or boldness or imagination. Think about the way we use the word entrepreneur in English. Right? We might say, oh, um, uh, you know, the professors who uh, organized and students who organized at this particular conference were extremely entrepreneurial. Right? Maybe we say this professor uh, uh, does things a little bit different uh, in his or her classroom. This professor is always coming up with new ways to present the material to students. What an entrepreneurial professor. Now, we typically don't mean by that a professor who runs their own company on the side. 
maybe the professor does, but we have in mind someone who takes the extra step, who you know, colors outside the lines, who thinks of things and does things that no one has done before you know, without being asked permission uh, in, in advance. That's often what we mean by being entrepreneurial. In fact, in the technical economics literature, maybe some of you have read books and articles by these authors, we have some even more precise notions of what it means to be entrepreneurial. Uh, Israel Kirzner, a great uh, contemporary Austrian economist, described entrepreneurship as the act of being alert to opportunities for gain. So when there is a kind of disequilibrium in the market, such that all profit opportunities, all profits have not already been grasped and seized, there are opportunities for new actors to come onto the scene to take advantage of those opportunities. If you think about uh, trying to find a place to park your car you know, at a shopping mall around Christmas, right? typically there are not many spaces available. Those spaces that were open have already been filled. But maybe if you know where to look, if you're you know, fast behind the wheel of your car, if you're clever, you can find an area of the parking lot where a space may be open. And if you're the first one to seize that space, hopefully without running anybody over or crashing into some other car, right? you would be the one who gains the profit, gains the benefit of being able to park in that space. Likewise, when prices are out of their equilibrium configurations, if you can buy low in one market and sell high in another market, there may be opportunities to earn financial profit through the act of arbitrage. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter, another great economist, characterized entrepreneurship as the act of innovating, right? innovating in the broad sense of novelty and creativity, which may include filing a patent or bringing a new technology to market, but it could also mean organizational innovation. It could mean much more general forms of novelty and creativity. Um, uh, the economist Ludwig von Mises, who I mentioned before, the American economist uh, Frank Knight, and, and other recent writers, including myself, have conceptualized entrepreneurship slightly differently uh, as the act of exercising judgment under uncertainty, making good decisions in conditions where we really don't have all the facts, we don't have an analytical model that tells us what to do, we don't have all of the data necessary to make a rational decision. Rather, we rely on our intuition, what you might call gut instinct, or what the Germans called Verstehen, meaning a kind of deep understanding that cannot easily be systematized and taught. Uh, this is the approach that I have uh, embraced in my own writings on entrepreneurship, but it is articulated very nicely in the works of Mises. Let me show you how Mises characterized entrepreneurship. The term entrepreneur, Mises writes in his great book, Human Action, as used by economic theory, means acting man exclusively seen from the aspect of the uncertainty inherent in every action. Now, in the real world, i.e. not the textbook world of neoclassical economics, all action is entrepreneurial to an extent. Right? We never know for sure whether the actions we undertake will bring about the results we desire. So we are all entrepreneurs in a broad sense. However, it's, it's often useful to think of a sort of a, a narrower set of entrepreneurs, namely those who are you know, full-time professional commercial entrepreneurs, people in business, right, who are bearing the uncertainty of the market economy by making investments, creating companies, bringing, uh, maintaining ongoing uh, operations introducing new products, finding better ways to make existing products, and so forth. In other words, people who bear uncertainty for a living in anticipation of financial gain and in an attempt to avoid financial loss. Those are sort of necessity and entrepreneurs in a narrower sense. Why, why, is, why are these people important? Well, the market economy is ultimately about these entrepreneurs who are engaged in bringing about uh, uh, firms, products, services, making the economy go. Mises put it as follows. It is impossible to eliminate the entrepreneur from the picture of a market economy. 
the various complementary factors of production cannot come together spontaneously. They need to be combined by the purposive efforts of men aiming at certain ends and motivated by the urge to improve their state of satisfaction. In eliminating the entrepreneur, one eliminates the driving force of the whole market system. In other words, the entrepreneur is not just a minor player. It's not just you know, an agent who comes about and, and, and gives us a new iPhone, whereas the rest of the economy is run by managers or executives or bureaucrats or, heaven forbid, government officials. No, the entrepreneur is the driving force of the market economy. It is the entrepreneur who organizes production, who takes productive resources, combines them, recombines them, speculates on them, and so forth, in an attempt to bring about goods and services that we, as consumers, desire. Sometimes those entrepreneurs are successful, and they have, after they've you know, created things, brought things to market, and sold them, they have many left over. Profit. Sometimes they're unsuccessful. They're not able to sell the goods and services they thought they could sell, and they end up with an economic loss. But this desire to achieve economic profit and to avoid economic loss is what drives individuals to produce, to create, to economize, to innovate, and so forth. So, why is this important? Right? As I said, you need the entrepreneur to organize and maintain the productive structure of the economy. That includes financial market entrepreneurship, as well as sort of construction, heavy industry, technology, mining, manufacturing, and so forth. But all of these profit-seeking individuals in the market economy are acting as entrepreneurs. We need entrepreneurs to innovate, to make things better than they were before not only to continue to produce the existing products and services on the market, but to give us novelty, to introduce new products, new ways of doing business, new forms of organizing, new methods of finance, new services that consumers can enjoy. I have a picture up here of Uber, the uh, taxi, the, the taxi-like uh, web uh, app, which is a phenomenally successful entrepreneurial innovation. Remember, innovation is not just bringing us new gadgets, New, new things that we can touch, but also more intangible things, like new ways of doing things that we did previously did before. And, of course, entrepreneurship is key to making economies grow. The reason that we have an advanced, modern, industrial economy in most parts of the world, in Western countries in particular, is because governments allowed entrepreneurs to do what they do best. Uh, maybe, many of you have probably seen the famous picture of the Korean Peninsula at night. Uh, in South Korea, you have capitalism, you have entrepreneurship. In North Korea, you don't. You don't have capitalism. Uh, you have bureaucrats and politicians, but you don't have commercial capitalist entrepreneurs, and the results kind of speak for themselves. Uh, a note about government before we conclude. Uh, do we need the government to intervene in some way to give us more entrepreneurship, to give us better entrepreneurship? The answer is no. The best thing that governments can do to promote entrepreneurship is simply to get out of the way and allow entrepreneurs to do what they do best. But I can be a little bit more specific. A bad macroeconomic policy, uh, credit expansion by the central bank, uh, action by the Federal Reserve or other agencies that gives us the business cycle. This is harmful to entrepreneurship. In Mises' language, the business cycle, inflation, these things distort economic calculation, meaning they make it much more difficult for entrepreneurs to anticipate the future state of the market and to make investments today in order to bring about improvements in the future. Uh, programs such as you know, bailing out failing enterprises, giving subsidies to particular kinds of firms, green tech, uh, you know, uh, uh, firms that are politically favored and so forth. Uh, these are harmful because they hinder the market process of selecting between better and less effective entrepreneurs. Remember, uh, if someone says capitalism or uh, the entrepreneurial market economy is the profit system, capitalism is a profit system, you should correct them 
because they're only half right. Capitalism is a profit and loss system, meaning that not only do we allow successful entrepreneurs to keep the fruits of their success, but we also don't bail out unsuccessful entrepreneurs. We let them go bankrupt. We let them go out of business. We free up those resources that they've been controlling and allow those resources to be made available to other entrepreneurs. So if the government says, oh, well, if your business is failing, we'll write you a check to keep it in place, or uh, we'll give you money to start the kinds of businesses we want, I'm looking, looking at you, Elon Musk, uh, we get a kind of crony capitalism, not a dynamic entrepreneurial capitalism that, that, we, that we desire. What about government programs to teach entrepreneurship, to train entrepreneurs, to subsidize them, to give them free, uh, to, to spend money on R&D, to motivate them to locate in particular places. Those programs have been, uh, uh, we don't expect them to work on theoretical grounds and we've all been uh, extremely unsuccessful uh, on historic grounds. Again, don't let anyone tell you that, oh, Silicon Valley is a great example of successful government intervention. No, Silicon Valley emerged from the bottom up, not because of anything that the state was doing, but because of the favorable configuration of resources and circumstances that allowed a lot of high-tech entrepreneurs to cluster in one particular location. The government cannot create another Silicon Valley uh, in Michigan or anywhere else. The best that government can do is get out of the way. Or, more generally, the best policy for entrepreneurship is stable money, secure property rights, and economic freedom. So I hope this discussion has given you a little taste of why entrepreneurship matters and why economists should think more systematically about entrepreneurship. Again, consult the great Austrians, Ludwig von Mises, Israel Kirzner, Peter Klein. Okay, maybe I'm stretching a little bit on that last one. Uh, and you can find many books and articles that give you much more detail about how to incorporate the entrepreneur into our analyses and why entrepreneurship is so important for a market economy and for the quality of life. Thank you very much for being with me today. I understand that I'm the only thing between you and your dinner. Is that correct? So uh, let me keep this short and sweet. First of all, um, congratulations to you. For those of you in particular who could have been somewhere else and chose to be here instead, who chose to exercise your freedom to invest in your education, in your knowledge, in a greater understanding of the free enterprise system. In doing so, you have demonstrated one of the qualities that distinguish entrepreneurs from the vast majority of the non-entrepreneurial uh, segment of society. Entrepreneurs are those people that make the tough choices, that are really interested in how things could be, not satisfied with the way things are. And you have demonstrated by your presence here today that you're not satisfied with your current state of knowledge, you're not satisfied with your current preparation, and you're willing to work hard and even to take risk. There's no guarantee that what you hear tonight is going to make any difference at all. But you are willing, on the advice of your professor or perhaps a colleague, to come and make that investment in your future. So I hope it has been worthwhile for you. We have many more events this week. And I hope that you'll continue to take advantage of these uh, possibilities this week and throughout your Northwood career. So congratulations and have a good night.